mic is on for calling the meeting of the Committee of the Whole this evening. We'll start off with uh, Mr. Longfellow, Single Canada. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons' command. Carlton Brass, a porte de peye, il se porte la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée de plus brillant espoir. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Thank you, Mr. Longfellow. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Madam Clerk, are there any uh, any additional items to be added? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, none this evening. Could I call for a motion to confirm the agenda? Moved by Ms. Councillor Doucette, seconded by Councillor Bodner, that the uh, agenda is confirmed. Any discussion? There being none, call for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? None? Carried? Are there any disclosures of interest? Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a, uh, I think it's an indirect pecuniary interest with item number 11, as it deals with Shirts and Shores and requests from them. I have a business located inside Shirts and Shores. Thank you. Any other disclosures of interest? Moving on to determination of committee items requiring separate discussion. Can I start with Mr. Bodner? Do you have any? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Item uh, 9 and item 12, please. Item 9 and item 12. Thank you, Mr. Bodner. Mr. Danch, none. Mr. Doucette. Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Item three. Um, six and seven. That's all. Mr. Maine. Not at the present time. Mrs. Demeray? None. Ms. Kenny? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yes, item eight. Item eight. Ms. Butters? Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My item's been lifted already. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Elliott, have another one. Sorry, thank you, Mayor. Uh, item 11 for the conflict. Anyone else before we move on? I call for a motion to uh, accept the approved committee items not requiring separate discussion. Moved by Madam Demeray and Mrs. Kenny. Seconded. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, if any? There being none? Okay. I don't believe we have any presentations here this evening. We have delegations. Uh, Laurie Kleinsmith, could you come forward to the mic, please, Laurie? There's a mic there. You just push the red button. You got it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I got the tutorial. <laughs> okay. So thank you for uh, having me here this evening. Um, 
I uh, am here on behalf of the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network to give you an overview of the, the work that the network has embarked on over the last few years and uh, some uh, directions that we're hoping to take and to do some, uh, hopefully take an opportunity to find some ways to strengthen ties with Niagara's municipalities. So this is one of 12 presentations that the network is making um, to, to uh, Niagara's 12 municipalities. Uh, last week um, I spoke in Pelham, which is the municipality I reside in. And I work in Port Colborne at Bridges Community Health Centre. And I'm pleased to have our executive director, Tara Lee McLean, here as e uh, this evening as well. And um, I'm just going to give you an overview. I certainly will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And um, we'll go from there. So let me just move forward here. So just, uh, just to give you a little picture of poverty in Niagara, and I will also throw in a few Port Colborne specific statistics that you may or may not be aware of. Um, these are from 2013. And when we look at shelter beds um, in the region, uh, over 6, 67,525 shelter beds nights were occupied uh, in the Niagara region in 2013. And 13% 13 of those were occupied by children. We know that our food banks are accessed um, quite heavily. Certainly here in Port Colborne, Port Care's food bank is very, uh, very much utilized. And the typical average across all of the food banks in Niagara region is that one in three are our children who are using our food banks. And for affordable housing, we have a wait list of over 11,000 people, uh, which is, uh, equates to approximately uh, 5,800 or so households who are waiting for affordable housing. Many of them have been waiting for a number of years. And of that breakdown, 37% are seniors. We have 29% who are singles or couples, and another 34% who are families. And just, just for your, your information in Port Colborne, um, as of uh, 2014, there are about 567 households just in Port Colborne of the 5,800 households who are waiting for affordable housing. So about a tenth. And we know we don't have a tenth of the population of Niagara Region. So we seem to have a, a higher than, than um, proportionate number than other communities might. And social assistance caseloads, uh, Ontario Works which, uh, as you may or may not know, provides a single adult $656 a month to, to live on. Um, we have caseloads, and now this could be caseloads, families, and or singles. In Port Colborne, we have 549 Ontario Works caseloads. And Ontario Disability Support Program, which uh, is for people who are on a disability, who may or may not be in a position to work. Quite often, it's very challenging to find work if you have a disability. And Port Colborne has 898 caseloads. Again, the actual numbers of those will be higher because that will include families in that, in that number. And in total, between Ontario Works and Ontario Disability, Niagara has over 25,000 caseloads. That's a lot of caseloads. We are above the provincial average. Okay, so just a, a little bit of background on the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network itself. The network um, is a group of over 30 social and health agencies, uh, members from the faith community. We have some business leaders who've joined the group. We have uh, representatives um, who live with who live in poverty, with current lived experience of poverty, who join the network as well. And we are a network, we're not an organization, we're not a, an agency, so we're really made up of um, different groups and individuals who have an interest in working on the issues of poverty. Our vision is that all Niagara residents will live above the poverty line, and that all sectors will be involved in addressing the issues of poverty the private sector, the public sector, and the not-for-profit. And that we can look beyond primarily a charitable model to get to the root causes of poverty and really tackle the issues from that level. The work that the network is doing is really at this point has been around information sharing and education around many of the myths and stereotypes that um, exist around people who live in poverty. There's a lot of um, misinformation, stereotypes, and stigma that people are facing uh, who live in poverty. 
We are also trying to change and shift attitudes around that as well. And Bridges is also doing some work in that area. We're also trying to get, again, more people involved. So engaging the community, engaging different sectors to try and stay um, on top of the issues, to better understand the issues, and to find ways of, of working together and collaborating. So just to give you a little structure on the network itself so you can get a picture of what, um, how it's made up. Um, as I said, in the center, we, we were structured as a network. Um, a round table meets once a month. Um, to share information and uh, to connect um, some of the different initiatives that we're working on. We do have a, a support system around us. So we have support from the Niagara region, uh, community and social services. We have a secretariat who is funded through the Niagara Prosperity Initiative um, funds that come through the region. And the um, current lead agency for that is the United Way of Niagara Falls and Greater Fort Erie. Um, there's also a convener position who is also funded through the Niagara Prosperity Initiative and they are currently um, funded through the Niagara Community Foundation, working through the, through the Community Foundation. We have a coordinating committee that uh, again meets monthly to, to keep the agenda set and to work on um, various projects. And then we've established ourselves under a number of subcommittees that are working in the areas of advocacy, engagement, uh, collaboration, communication, and research and evaluation. And also working in the network are some tables that are looking at some specific areas that we've prioritized as public policy issues around housing, transportation, uh, and we're starting to look at the areas of in income security. So things like a living wage and what a basic income might look like. How can we bring those um, ideas forward in Niagara and how can we work together to try and actually advocate for some of those changes that are needed. We also liaise with other groups in the community so we're very much you know under the un understanding that we're not doing this alone. There are other agencies and, and other groups and other networks out there that are also working on some of these issues. So the Social Assistance Reform Network, the Coalition to End Violence Against Women, there's a number of areas where there's overlap and synergy being, being uh, built so that we can really work together and, and make sure that we're not duplicating what we're doing, but that we're finding a collective voice. So the network itself, uh, really it started in 2011, but a, a public launch was held in May of 2013. Um, during the time leading up to the launch, we spent time developing, um, really getting sort of our, our heads wrapped around the research and the, the necessary statistics and data to support our work. Uh, we developed a public presentation that we're able to do um, that's called What We Know About Poverty and ways that people can understand going beyond the charitable model to also address the root causes of poverty. We've developed uh, fact sheets and an infographic card as well that uh, I'll share with you after that also are supporting our work. We have a website, wipeoutpoverty.ca. We have a speakers bureau that will go out and do public presentations um, on request and we've done a number of them around the region so far. Um, we also have uh, social media which is really another way to get the word out and we have uh, a very active uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts and lots of businesses are starting to follow us. We're very pleased to, to see some new levels of engagement happening. We've also been able to um, <coughs> be able to connect in with local media. So Sun Media, as you know, has been running a series called Faces of Poverty for the last year. And members from our network have been called to be subject matter experts on some of the topics that they've been covering. Um, we've been able to provide um, input on the municipal election night. Our chair, Elizabeth Zimmerman, was asked to be a spokesperson on municipal election night last fall. So we were very pleased to have her do that. And she has also been asked even uh, to speak on TVO's agenda last fall as well on poverty, which is fantastic. We have been submitting editorials and letters to the editors to the newspaper on various um, issues. We work with Niagara Connects and we've been writing blogs and articles to try and again share, um, share information and stay up to date on the current issues that uh, are facing Niagara but even beyond. 
We participated last, uh, in 2013 in the five year, the helping in the development of the Ontario, the new Ontario, Ontario Poverty Reduction Strategy, which was launched this past year. So we held a consultation with uh, MPP Jim Bradley in St. Catharines and brought folks from Port Colborne were even able to participate in that, which was great. Last October, we uh, participated in a, in a cross-Canada campaign. Um, fortunately, the weather wasn't the greatest on the day in Port Colborne. I was down at the market and uh, <laughs> got a little rained out, but we had some indoor events that went very well in other parts of the region. Uh, the campaign was part of an awareness campaign to, to highlight the need for federal leadership on addressing poverty. We know that not any one level of government can tackle this and not any one sector. And we know that we need leadership from our federal leaders as well. And this was a, 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 an opportunity to raise awareness of the need for an actual plan with timelines and, and targets and, and the necessary investments to address poverty. So we were pleased to participate in that event as well. And during the municipal election last fall, we launched a uh, position paper on transportation. We're very much in support of it, an integrated, uh, seamless regional transit system to help um, all of Niagara move around. But certainly, from the, the, the lens of poverty, we know that uh, transportation is a barrier for many folks to be able to get to appointments, to work, looking for work, and that if we can have a better system in Niagara, that that will be a huge benefit for many people on low incomes. We also know that there are many roles that municipal governments can play. And we shared a document that I must say I give credit to, uh, to the mayor for reaching out to me actually during the um, campaign and asking me for some ideas of what municipalities can do to, to address poverty. And I took what I had started to share with him and decided to share it with all 12 municipalities. So thank you, John, for that. Because it really has, has made a difference in the work that the network is doing and we're recognizing that we need to be reaching out to all of our municipalities and our regional government and strengthening ties. So that's led to our presentations. In our document, which is in your, um, in your package, uh, if you haven't had a look, chance to look through it, we encourage you to look at it um, to see what are, what are some roles that municipalities can play. And the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network is here to support that work to strengthen ties with you to make sure that we can move forward. For example, in Welland, they've had a, a committee of council. Well, so can we, I guess it's a, an advisory committee, they call it, on poverty reduction for a few years. And the City of St. Catharines is in the process of forming one. So that's just an example of one way you can get started so that you can then look at the issues and determine what, what, what can we do. There are things that we can do at the local level. And lastly, We know that municipalities and, and regional government do care about addressing poverty and that they do want to go beyond just band-aid solutions. We have the, the investment the region's made in the Niagara Pro Prosperity Initiative and the collective voice that we've seen happening on bringing Go Transit to Niagara, which is wonderful. And we know that there is really strong support for that regional integrated transit system. We want to, as a network, work with, with all of you, with all municipalities and with our regional government to see how we can have a collective voice coming from Niagara, not just within, but to those other levels of government as well that also need to be involved in this and the other sectors as well. So we look forward to strengthening ties with you and to continuing to, to work to wipe out poverty in Niagara. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Lang Smith. I wonder if you might entertain any questions that council might have? Any questions of members of council? Mr. Doucette? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, not a question as much as a comment. I was showing Lori this um, at the beginning, and I couldn't before um, she came up, and I was late to be here. But our strategic planning that we've looked at, uh, one of the issues that, that we discuss is Number two here is that Council's Healthy Community and Quality of Life Committee consider poverty reduction strategies and affordable housing policies and conjoin with regional initiatives and so on. This Council is very much 
in tune with that and we want to do something. We need to do something. These are our people and we, we are interested in them. And I just wanted you to know that we definitely are on the same page for that. And, and you can ask almost any one of the councillors. So just so that you know, we, we agree. Any other questions, councillors? I, I just have one question. Um, if, if you had one ask, what would be your top priority for us as a municipality and as a council to do? To ask then. Housing. When you hesitated there when I asked for what would be your one ask, uh, I thought you were trying to pick out one uh, out of many. Uh, so I'll give you two. Oh, What's your second ask? One. Questions of council arising out of uh, my two questions. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Laurie, I'm on the board of United Way of South Niagara, and we work along with your group. And uh, I'm really happy to see that part of your um, your attack on this is the root cause of poverty, because if without without having a big hit in that area, you know, everything else is just keeping people going. But if you can give them a hand up, then that's a, a great help and hopefully move them out of the poverty uh, cycle. So uh, congratulations on everything you're doing and we're happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. There being no further questions, uh, oh, Councillor Butters. I, I want to thank Lori for being here um, today uh, between I think really between Bridges and Port Cares and it, it, that those are two um, really important groups in Port Coburn that help a tremendous amount of people. So please keep doing the good work that you're doing and I think by our strat planning sessions coming up, it's like very good timing, very good timing finally. So um, I'm really glad to see this presentation from you and I'm looking forward to working with my fellow councillors on bigger and better things. Conjunction with, in conjunction with all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Butters. Thank you, Ms. Kleinsmith. I really appreciate it, your attendance here this evening. Thank you. Again. 
Thank you. Moving on to the mayor's report, um, just going to be very brief. I'm going to point out that the uh, leisure glide for this for this spring and summer has uh, been just released. Uh, I encourage everyone to pick up a copy. There's a lot of good, interesting activities in here for the entire family you know, of all ages. That's no question. The second part of my uh, report would be uh, a brief little video that we have. Uh, honey, can you uh, provide us with that on the screen? It's a deal with Gold Transit. Since October of last year, a team from Niagara Falls, St. Catharines, Grimsby, Niagara on the Lake, Lincoln, and Niagara region has been working together, coordinating our efforts to bring daily ghost train service to Niagara. We'd like to provide you with an update on our progress, as well as some key future milestones. Go Train was identified by the region as the number one priority. As a matter of fact, it was an election issue during the by-election in Niagara Falls spring of last year. We are unified as a community to get the familiar green and white trains rolling through our community. We met recently in late 2014 with the Premier and her Chief of Staff as well as Transportation Minister Del Duca and his Chief of Staff as we discussed how we could move daily GO Train commuter service to Niagara Falls forward. At the meeting with the Premier, it was directed to us to work closely with her officials to explore all options related to GO Train service in Niagara and to report back to her in early 2015 with cost-effective and viable options to make daily GO Train service possible. To undertake this work, we've assembled a project team with input from every community in Niagara, working together to present a viable and realistic, compelling business case to present back to the Premier. Our business plan will map out a scenario for daily GO Train commuter service that connects Niagara to the GTA through Hamilton. It will be a solution that is innovative, affordable, and doable within a year. We have the support of Niagara's MPPs and MPs. We have the support of our local elected leaders. And we have the attention of Queen's Park and the Premier. Now is the time for Niagara to demonstrate there is an urgent and real demand for the service. We need our municipalities, residents, businesses, and community organizations in every corner and community in Niagara speaking with one voice to let the provincial decision makers know now is the time for GO in Niagara. GO Rail expansion can be an economic game changer for Niagara, a catalyst for growth, development and jobs. We know GO is important to our communities. In the coming weeks we are launching a number of ways to get Niagara speaking out of the benefits of how daily GO train service is critical to Niagara's future. We need everyone getting involved to make this a reality. We believe that through the strength of our business case, and the power of our active, unified voice, we can secure a clear commitment from the province in 2015 to bring daily GO trains to Niagara. But we need your help. Our working group team want you to be involved, informed, and updated because we need your active participation and together as a unified team, we're gonna be successful. And if I could quote Spencer Fox, president of ES Fox, GO train will be the economic silver bullet for Niagara. Thank you. Um, is there any questions on that presentation? Basically, uh, all mayors in the Niagara region have signed a letter to Kathleen Quinn indicating that uh, extending GO train to Niagara is a top priority uh, for many obvious reasons, but the gentleman on the uh, on the tape were really along uh, along the road of the uh, of the well, it's along the QEW from uh, Grimsby all the way to Niagara Falls. But the mayors uh, in the southern tier uh, also see the value uh, to our communities, to our people, and that uh, this will be a top priority for, as I said, the region to move forward with. As Chair Caslin said, within the year. Uh, so that may be optimistic, but uh, it's doable. Any questions from anyone on the uh, issue? There being none, let's move on to the agenda. Our regional councillor is, uh, is away this week, so he uh, will not be making a report. Although, uh, I don't know whether he reported last week, but certainly 
or the last council meeting that the uh, police services board did uh, pass a motion that the police services station in Port Coburn uh, will uh, will remain open at least until 2019. So that's good news for our community. Uh, are there any councilor's items that uh, anyone wishes to <laughs> okay raise today? Councilor Dan, you were first. Uh, just a public note there, uh, we have a blood donors clinic on uh, Wednesday this week at Port High. It runs from uh, 2 till 7 and uh, we wanted to help with the gift of life. Uh, maybe you could donate a pint. Uh, I do it quite regularly and uh, it feels good. So if anybody else is interested, it's Wednesday at the Port High. Thank you. Good news, Councillor Dance. Councillor Doucette. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Just a reminder to everyone, ward meeting tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, Tim Hortons. And on Thursday the 12th, it'll be at Valet at 6.30. Uh, I have to also have to indicate that I might be a, a little late. There was a meeting called and I have to go off to a meeting, but I will be there. So if I don't get there right away at 7 o'clock, just wait for me. I won't be too long after that. But Councillor Demaray will be there right oh, at the start time and she'll handle yeah. everything in your absence. Yes, she will. Right, I'm Councillor sorry. Demaray? I will. Okay. You will. Thank you. She will. I just do that for Brian. <laughs> Any other councillors on my left? Councillor Elliott. You're so good. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, if it would uh, benefit council, I'll take a couple of minutes. I did have a chance to attend um, the Roma Ogre Combined Conference. Roma is the Rural Ontario Municipal Association, and Ogre is the Ontario Good Roads Association Conference in Toronto um, back on February 23rd and 24th. Um, fantastic conference, a lot of great speakers. Um, I was surprised and uh, great to see that a number of First Nations people spoke um, and they were included, I believe, for one of the first times at the, uh, at the conference. So it was really good that they, uh, that they were included. They do share residences and areas that they reside in with a lot of the rural and uh, northern regions. So it was great to get their perspective. Um, one thing for engineering, one of the, uh, one of the chiefs spoke about um, infrastructure and capital asset management, and he was kind of surprised that municipalities were just starting their asset management plans in the last year or two when they've been looking after their assets for the last 20 years and had a lot of them already replaced, which was kind of a shot across the bow, but uh, I do believe that it uh, resonated with a lot of people in the room. Um, I did actually uh, attend one of the um, asset management uh, concurrent sessions and I had talked to Ron about this earlier. Um, every single thing that was brought up in this session with regards to asset management and the replacement of water, wastewater, road, sidewalks, everything to that, uh, to that effect, we have either done, are doing, or have implemented in the city of Port Coburn. There wasn't one box that was left unchecked. I thought I'd go and I'd get some you know, sneaky tips on what to bring back and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, yeah, we've done that, yeah, we've done that. Ron reported on that last meeting. Yes, we've done this, 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 and this. And I thought, maybe a quick call and get our engineering department down here. They can deliver the address because everything that was, was talked about literally, this city is either doing or has done. So we are so far ahead of the curve that I wanted to point that out and say congratulations to engineering, planning, and our money man, Peter, because we have spent money in the right places. We are doing the right things. It may not sound like it. We may have a lot of infrastructure that we do need to replace, but we are well on the way to achieving what others are just beginning to start with. So congratulations to all the departments on their cooperation and getting us where we are. Um, I did have the opportunity to go into a concurrent session that talked about natural gas and while we just turn up the furnace and turn on your hot water and out comes hot water heated by natural gas or your stoves or your fireplaces, a lot of the rural areas do not have accessibility to natural gas because the Ontario Energy Board restricts the way that it's delivered and they need to have a certain amount of requirement for the natural gas in order for them to deliver it to these areas. The Ontario Energy Board is reducing their, I guess their ceiling on what they want for consumption of gas before they start to run lines. The provincial government offered support for this 
and there is a conversation going on right now between um, Enbridge and I'm trying to look at the other uh, gas supplier. In a, you, uh, yeah, Union Gas, yeah, Union gas. was supplying uh, rural farmers mm -hmm. with this. They showed a couple of charts, and the cost savings for natural gas as opposed to electricity and uh, propane, generally in the area of 50%. And the farmers all said to a person that if they could take this money, reinvest it in their farms, spend the money in their communities instead of paying for their heat and hydro, um, it would benefit everybody. So. It was interesting to hear that my dad sold gas for consumers gas, provincial gas back in the day, sold it to rural people in this area. And I can remember him saying that he had gone out to farmers in Niagara and said, you will never get natural gas because the, the position of provincial gas at the time was it's too far, consumption isn't great enough. After he retired six months later, they were running gas out to places he told that they would never get it. So. The expansion of it is coming, which is a which is a boon for the farmers in rural areas, <clears throat> and we are considered rural. So, although I was talking to B on the way in, rural to some people means up north and mid Ontario, not so much in southern Ontario. But we are rural. If you take a look at our city, we are concentrated with an urban area, small portion of town, right around the canal. Everywhere else is rural. So I would say, yes, we are rural. We're not north, but we are rural to some effect. Um, there was a great presentation by Joel Faulkner with a, uh, um, a group called Area One Farms. They are the seed money providers for young farmers up north. They will provide funding to buy land so that young farmers can stay in the business, get in the business, earn equity in their land and keep farming in their families. A lot of people, the young folks, have not seen any profit for their parents, therefore have decided to opt out of farming. This is one way that they've seen that they can grow farming as a sustainable future for young people. So it was really good to hear it. Um, they do have a lot of people with seed money that are willing to, to lend it out to get young farmers to stay in the game and get back in the game. They also said that there's some area up north around the Timmins area, just around there, that, believe it or not, is the next booming for farming. While the area is not farmed to the extent that it is in southern Ontario, they did say with the cultivation of land for a couple of years, it will become receptive to uh, seeds for uh, barley and, and hay and straw and corn and things like that. It is a couple of years out, but it surprised me. They did say that, and I checked the map when I got back, that it's south of the prairies. And I thought, well, yeah, but it's northern Ontario and it's really, really cold. And then when you look at a map, yeah, it is south of the prairies. So therefore, their growing season is about the same length as the prairies. And we all know what grows out there. So they're looking forward to that. Um, it was a great, uh, a great conference. The speech by the, uh, by the premier was a whole lot of uh, generalities, not a lot of specifics. Um, she did commit to the continued funding of the Rural Economic Development Program and the, uh, um, I'm going to forget which, uh, which fund it was, OCIF, the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund. Uh, they did commit to that, so uh, that's good news going forward. A um, couple of the good, good, uh, good conferences. Would have been nice to have some friends at the friends of the conference I did run for the board didn't make it that's uh, that's neither here nor there it was great to go to there were so many great events and concurrent sessions to go to it was literally hard to choose one morning I flipped the coin to figure out which one to go to because they're both of interest to us and I couldn't figure out which one to go to so it's like okay I'm going here if we had uh, another person or two to go and, and pick up some more information Highly recommend it uh, for next year. I know it sounds funny, rural Ontario, but we are included in that. Good roads. Um, be interesting to see if any of our uh, works guys uh, would attend next year. There's probably some good tips that they can pick up. So I just want to report on that. It was a good conference to go to and uh, plan on going next year. It's worth going. Thank you for your update, Councillor Elliott, and also for the acknowledgement of, uh, uh, of our staff. Uh, that's uh, good to hear that uh, we're in the forefront uh, as far as our staff and what they do for us are. 
Anyone else on my right? Have a, yes, Mr. Maine, Councilor Maine. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I was looking for my storm sewer today to get get one of my kids or my daughter to shovel it out so the water would go in, because John knows me. And uh, it was almost impossible to find. So my daughter said where she lives in Ottawa that when they mark the streets, and the guy comes down and marks the streets, they put a little line across the road, which lines up with the storm sewers for that specific reason because of all the snow they get in Ottawa. Now, I see we have a contract coming up for, for doing the marking. I wonder if we could look into that uh, just for the simple fact, maybe you only have to use it once a year, but uh, a good way to get the water off the road. Mr. Hanson, do you have any comment on that last <coughs> comment? Certainly, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'd be happy to look at that um, uh, with the line marking. Um, it's something that we haven't done in the past, but certainly something could be investigated. Thank you. Anything further on my right? Good, thank you very much. Are there any uh, staff responses to uh, oh. Mr. Bodner? Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Elliott's talk about natural gas just reminded me that they had the big chili cook off at Churchland uh, <laughs> Community Center uh, <clears throat> on the weekend, and our very own Councillor Butters won with her chili. So, you know. <laughs> and, Mr. Mayor, um, I had the pleasure of representing. Um, Niagara South Coast Tourism Association at a meeting with the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport on Friday in, uh, in Niagara Falls. There was about 12 of, it, 12 of us that had the opportunity at a round table to sit with them for close to two hours and, um, and talk about tourism opportunities and challenges in our area. It was uh, extremely good. Um, he's looking to possibly come this way in the summer, so I made an invitation to see if he planned it around Canal Days. We could give him a little tour and show him what a real big festival looks like. Uh, I'm sure he's been at some, but we can show him a real good one. So just wanted to, uh, to highlight that. That was a great opportunity to, uh, to talk to the minister, and uh, he's a very intelligent, nice gentleman, and uh, quite open and receptive and quite honest with his... Uh, with his answers to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bodner. Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I almost forgot to report on the fact that I, I went to a, an active transportation <coughs> summit on Thursday um, and gathered all kinds of great information, which I'll be sharing with staff uh, sooner rather than later. And uh, hopefully, we can uh, bring some of some of these great ideas to Port Colborne. But uh, the best thing I think I learned about was sticky streets. I don't know if anybody's heard of sticky streets before, but it, it's in a, a complete street environment and they, we create sticky streets so people will walk along and stop and see what's, what's around them. It's kind of a neat thing. But uh, had a great time, learned a lot, and uh, like I said, I will be bringing that forward. Um, again, can't tell you how important cycle tourism is becoming and uh, we need to get on that. Uh, Councillor Bodner is fully aware of that. More was, uh, was spoken at the uh, Active Transportation Summit, but, uh, and much more to come, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Demery. Councillor Elliott. Mayor, my apologies for, I was thinking about it before. Um, I was wondering if uh, Ron could uh, give us an update on the frozen water situation, and also in the mail today, um, there was a letter that came out that said water bills will be estimated, and I wonder if Peter could uh, touch on that after Ron talks about the frozen services. <coughs> Mr. Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in the last two months, we've had 255 frozen water services, which is about 10 times the normal amount for a typical winter. Um, the calls coming in in the last two months, they peaked at about 15 per day in February, which is extremely high. Uh, we've cleared 133 of the services to date. There's still 122 outstanding. So we're working away at this uh, seven days a week. As long as it's light out, we've had crews out working. Uh, the problem is somewhat compounded by the number of water main breaks we're getting as well. So we've got water main breaks on top of the frozen services. So working away at it, uh, we have a priority list, as Council is aware. Uh, seniors, disabled, 
other people on the list so we can assist businesses that need water to carry on business. We tried to prioritize those uh, those businesses, those locations, and get them to the top of the list. So continue to work away at this, and hopefully with the extended weather forecast we're seeing now that uh, we only had one frozen service come in today, which is a good sign. And if we can get the snow off the ground, get the frost off the ground, uh, we should be good to go. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Any questions of Mr. Hansen? Yes, Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, while we're on that, before we get to Peter. Ron, can you talk about that this is not an issue of the quality of the pipes that are in the ground? I've seen that that mm -hmm. was kind of thrown out uh, in a couple of uh, couple of discussions. This has no nothing to do with the type of pipe or the style of pipe or how it's installed or anything like that. It's Mother Nature at work, full stop. Can you explain that? Through you, Mr. Mayor. You're, you're exactly right, uh, Councillor Elliott. This is strictly a factor of the depth of frost this year. Uh, we're seeing frost at four and a half and five feet. Uh, being in Port Coburn with the shallow rock and so on, we have many, many services that are four feet or less. So it's a, the frozen services are a factor not of the pipe material themselves. We have galvanized, some, a few lead services, uh, plastic pipe and a lot of copper services. It's not a factor. Uh, the frost at four and a half, five feet will freeze any of those pipes at any time. Uh, I think just to add to that, uh, and I mentioned at the budget meeting, we're going to be coming forward with a budget request uh, in the water and wastewater portion of the budget to ask for additional funds to address uh, many of the water services that we're seeing frozen here that are on the city side to try to rectify those problems and, and lower these water services wherever possible during the upcoming construction season. Any other questions of Mr. Hansen? There be none. Move on to Treasurer Sinez. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Elliott. Um, yes, we have um, the, the first um, cycle of water bills went out in the mail last week, and uh, there was a number of them that, uh, due to the fact of the, the weather, the uh, amount of snow um, that's, that's accumulated, um, either on the roadways, the walkways, the uh, driveways and also covering uh, sometimes the actual pad where the meter is read. Uh, there was a lot of um, that our, uh, our meter reader could not um, get to and, and do a reading. Uh, so what we had to do was actually go back and do an estimate of, uh, of the actual bill and basically we're go we look at um, previous year's um, consumption um, and if it was, you know, it tends to be a little high previous year we, we, we almost look at three years uh, so we sort of look at that look at, at what an estimate would be and then and then we're estimating the bill so we did send uh, include a letter um, with the water bills that went out just to let uh, people know that uh, their um, meter um, possibly was not actually read and that we've estimated and uh, essentially would be then caught up at the, the next actual reading um, the first um, we had, I believe, about oh, 100 or so that we had to, uh, a couple hundred that we had to estimate. The second billing that, that'll be going out shortly, um, which is the, the second cycle, is going to have more estimated readings because what ended up happening was we ran into the thaw and the freeze and everything became very icy and slippery and it became an, a safety issue for our meter reader to be out there and, um, and reading. Um, so there'll be more estimates that's going to uh, take place uh, on the second cycle, and because of the slow or the, of the the timing of getting out and uh, doing the readings, and with the weather and that, it basically slowed the pace down of the meter reader too. So we we're a little bit behind in actually getting the bills out. So we're going to do an estimated billing for the uh, second cycle, and this week they're starting to read actually the third cycle, so that we sort of get try to get caught back up and with the weather hopefully turning nicer it'll be easier for the meter reader to get out there and get back uh, on pace so we're we're trying to compensate that way and then the next reading will be actual readings thank you mr sanez uh, is there any one have any questions arising from mr sanez's intervention there being none uh, are there any other uh, staff who have uh, wish to report uh, and follow up to previous questions Yes, Mr. Sines. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to um, let council and the public know that uh, we are having another uh, budget meeting on next Monday, the 16th, and at 6.30 here in the council chambers, and uh, to uh, discuss the final part of the budget, hopefully. Thank you, Mr. Finesse. No other questions? Uh, I'd like to seek adoption of the minutes of the sixth meeting regular of the Committee of the Whole of February 23rd, 2015. Councillor Butters, seconded by Councillor Danch. Any questions or discussion? Any errors or omissions? There being none, the call for the question. All those in favor of the adoption of the minutes? Carried. Opposed? Carried. Now, we'd like to move on to consideration of items uh, requiring separate discussion. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, could, with with uh, Council's permission, could we move on um, the butterfly report item 12? up to the top yes, so we could. that these folks here could, um, who are waiting very patiently get their stuff. That's an excellent table. excellent suggestion, Councillor Butters. Thank you. Can we refer to item number 12? Uh, I understand uh, an individual wishes to make a presentation or to comment on, on this item <coughs> to the committee. Oh yes, that's uh, we do need a motion to uh, to allow uh, an intervention moved by Councillor Kenny, seconded by Councillor Demaray. Uh, there's a, a all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. There is a, uh, a microphone button there. Thank you. Your Worship, thank you, and members of Council, thank you. My name is uh, George McKibben. And I've been uh, designated by the Environmental Advisory Committee to uh, come with you today to uh, speak to this issue and answer any questions that you might have. With me uh, today is uh, Patty Moss, who has spoken to you earlier in September about this very exciting project that we're happy and pleased to uh, bring to you for your consideration. In addition, uh, Bev Palma and Paul Rizuki. Uh, Bev is the uh, chair of our committee and uh, Paul is also a member and uh, we're all keenly anxious to get ahead with this project and, uh, and if you have any questions please feel free to uh, ask uh, Patty and myself and we'll do our best to answer those questions. Any questions of Councillor Rodner? Mr. Mayor, we gonna, this report is coming to us tonight obviously and I pulled it. Um, are we going to do all our questions and everything now and then before we do that uh, is that the well i would encourage the questions of, we're going to re hopefully refer this to uh, back to the committee for uh, further consideration but if mm -hmm. council members have questions now i think uh, let's get them on the table right now sure um sure okay yes Councilor Bodner. um i guess it's just about how we're going to roll this out i'm not against it at all i think it's a great idea as far as the butterfly part goes i'm i'm concerned that the the um the way it's being um done with roadside um weeds for lack of a better um a better thing is could be very problematic and i think we need to be absolutely certain we have every member of the public canvassed on those roads I would like to see a letter go door to door and get a response back a yes or no response back from them because I know in the past we've had people call us if we have a wet spring and the weeds are going faster than our cutters come out um, we have people calling and wanting those weeds cut down um, and I know people take it upon themselves to cut the other side of their property, their property plus the other side of the road in front of them. Um, so it may not just be as easy as saying we're going to let those reeds, weeds grow because people are actually going to take it upon themselves to cut large swaths of it. And there's also the fact that um, some of the farmers may be concerned about crops that are growing there. And then you're going to have to, I say you, the, the committee, is going to have to figure out who rents those fields because it may not be the owner it'll be the person that rents that field that puts a crop on it so there could be some late work involved in getting a hold of those people too so so i think the recommendation to send this back to staff for a report 
to really lay out how this should unfold, I think the last thing we want to have is a whole bunch of people coming, a whole bunch of people, a number of people that might want to come forward after you're well into it saying, I want those weeds cut. You know, So if there could be a consensus beforehand, and um, you know, I don't know what the staff report would say, but I, I think it probably should involve some um, option. Are there areas that the city owns that could be uh, set aside for um, either planting of milkweed or plants that would attract the butterflies and feed them and everything. So I think it's uh, there's a ways to go on this yet. So I'll wait to hear if anybody else has concerns. And uh, I don't know whether Mr. Hansen might have something to throw in from the Perhaps Councillor Butters, site. we could have Councillor Butters first. A question, Councillor Butters. Okay. Oh. Um, go ahead. We've gone over um, these items um, in the Environment Advisory Committee level. So we've talked about um, going around, getting to all the farmers, the different um, owners on, and this, this is, but keep in mind this involves three, this pilot project is three roads. Okay, so Pinecrest, um, uh, Cedar Bay, and from um, Folly Street uh, South. So that you're talking about relatively short sections there towards the lake, right? That, that, that we're looking at as pilot projects. So all those, all the residences on those roads would have to be um, talked with and our committee is well aware of the, the need for that. Education is like the most important part of this, this whole project really, is, is for the buy-in of, of the public to, um, to understand why we, why we want to do this. So um, I think George and Patty, they can, um, I'm sure they've got something to say about this too, but we talked about all those things. The whole point of bringing this back to this council, the council sent this, sent this to the Environment Committee to come up with a plan. That, that was how this kind of all started back a few months ago. So the Environment Committee got together, together um, with George and Patty and the different ones, uh, Deanna Lindblad, they put their heads together and came up with this kind of a plan this kind of a pilot project. So we know that there's a lot of work ahead. Um, I think Patty can speak to about the, um, the different weeds and how it's gonna be monitored and I'll leave that to her because she knows more about that than I do, that's for sure. Um, but we, I, I totally concur with Councillor Bodner. There is work to be done here. Are we getting too far ahead? Well, we gotta get, th this is the start of it and to bring it back, to this plan back to this council just to for you all to say yeah that sounds like a good idea and if and if you want staff to have I mean staff's had a look at it as far as what we've brought forward and if need, if it needs to be tweaking uh, that's fine too but but we do need to have also the time to be able to get to the different residences on those three roads so maybe Patty and George would want to um, jump in and add their 18 cents worth because you just got my two. Patty or George, or you wish to comment? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, through you to uh, Council. A um, couple of logistical questions. We, not questions, comments. Uh, we are volunteers, and uh, it will take us a bit of a time to get together our educational package to hand out and, and our interview strategy with the uh, landowners to make sure that everybody indeed is spoken to and to the extent possible, we'll ascertain uh, what the comments are. And our plans were to bring that back to council so that you would have the benefit of knowing uh, what the residents, uh, what their response was objectively. Um, so it'll give us a, it will take us a bit of time because we are volunteers. And I understand that uh, uh, Mr. Hansen has a suggestion that there needs to be some further reporting on the uh, the uh, Weed Control Act and the like. And uh, one thing that is not in the report is that uh, we do have colleagues from the Ontario Agricultural College at the University of Guelph assisting us uh, in, in the work that we're doing. So perhaps we can obtain some of that information and pass it along to you as well. With respect to the monitoring of weeds, uh, Patty does have a plan for that. And perhaps you could describe that, Patty? Sure, I can. Um, I think 
a lot of this is based on fear base because a lot of communities have no communities have really started this. And I think once you go door to door, speaking with the, the farmers and the residents and finding out their concerns, and also um, letting them know what monitoring and what practices we're going to follow during this trial period of three years. Uh, one thing I'm going to look into is uh, just before is identifying plant species. I think that's the biggest concern is what plant species are growing along our, our roadsides and are they going to affect especially uh, farmers' fields. Uh, so before the first cut, I'll be identifying plant species as well as the first cuts around in the end of June. And then whereas every two weeks, I'll go out and monitor the roadsides and look into what plants are reaching maturity, either uh, flowering or developing seed, identifying which plants are and whether or not those plants are a concern for farmers, as well as I'll take uh, <coughs> special consideration with farmers' fields, I'll be taking uh, photo observations, as well as what plants are and vegetation are growing alongside their fields. And uh, throughout the, the three, if this is approved, and I can have this for three years, we can study and see if it, there is going to be any impact for the farmers. Uh, as well as residents, that there is mi most of the residents already cut their ditches. I would say about, in my guess, about 75%. So what I'm looking at is not really the residents are already cutting their ditches, because they're going to still cut them. And you know what? It, for those ditches to be growing, to outgrow, it's to be all grass anyways. It's the ditches I'm looking at that residents aren't concerned about. So those are the residents I'm really focusing on, too, when I go door to door, door is the residents that aren't cutting their ditches, waiting for the city to come by and cut them. And that's where the milkweed and the native plants are located because they're only cut three times a year, therefore it allows natural vegetation to grow amongst those roadsides. But in areas where <coughs> residents have been cutting them for the past three years, there's just grass growing there anyway. So my focus is more on the areas where residents aren't cutting them. Thank you. Um, Anything further, Councillor Butters? Every now, Councillor Kenny, then Councillor Demaray, and then perhaps a comment from Mr. Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Butters, I was chair of the committee when Patty first came to us and started mm -hmm. talking to us about it, and we thought it was a good idea. But we we did bear in mind the fact that the farmers and their concerns. Um, I just I just want to reemphasize that, uh, just like George told you, there are, they are. A volunteer committee which means that's a lot of work put on them because we've asked them to investigate it our recommendation says that the advisory committee proposed plan to is the word here is to delay we're not going to eliminate it the key word here is to delay the roadside cuttings so that the um, monarch butterfly which which patty has explained to us when she made her presentation to us and uh, the key here is education. And I know that you're going to, and the committee is going to work on getting those people in that small pilot area, as uh, Councillor Butters told you, it's a small pilot area that we want to try. Um, but the key is education. But I really do feel that as, as a council, we've asked them to do that, that we need to be on board with this too. We can't just expect this committee of council to go out and do this work themselves. We have to be on board with this. We have to have our residents on board with this. And but I think that's the only way we're going to have true success. Um, so that's just my comments. Thank you. Councillor Bodner had requested another comment. And then yeah. Councillor Doucette. Nope. Just Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I get all the volunteer stuff because I'm on volunteer committees too. And it, you know, it's not something you can just send staff out to do. You're going to be out there in the trenches doing it. But you know, there, there's more to this than just, you know, there's a safety aspect. If we get a wet spring, those weeds are going to be higher than the mailboxes. They are. We've, we've had that in wet springs. Are you going to stay back from people's driveways so that when they go to back out, they're not, you know, worried about not being able to see? Like, there's, there's a lot of things to look. How about the trail? You're going to go from Kalali Street down to the lake, right? So it crosses the trail. How far back from the trail are you going to stay? Every year we fight to get enough brush cut back so that somebody on the trail doesn't get hit by a car coming through. You know, they're supposed to stop. They don't always do. So I'm not 
quite ready to just give you and say, just go ahead and do it. There's, there's definite things, I think, from a liability standpoint and just common sense to our taxpayers that we got to look at here. You know, I'm totally for it, but if we don't do it right, it's going to crash and burn and your three years will be a wasted summer and nothing will happen. So if we don't get it right, right at the beginning, and we may have to tweak it. You know, there's there's definite things we got to look at here. So I'm just trying to figure out how we're going to do it rather than just say, knock yourself out, go ahead and, and do it. There's there's concerns. Councilor Doucette. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. If you look carefully at the report, it says delaying the second roadside cutting. So the first one, around June sometime, is going to happen, period. That's, we're not asking for that one to be delayed in any way, shape, or form. It's the one in the middle of the summer that creates the plants that the monarch live on. Live on. So that if we do have a wet spring, June will take care of that. The June cutting will take care of that. And all we're asking for is the one in the middle to be delayed. Not eliminated, delayed strictly. And the reason for that is, if you look carefully, and I mean, Patty gave us a, an excellent presentation in, 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 I believe it was October last year, where the monarch butterfly is at the point where it will probably become or go on a list for possible extinction. It is one of the only butterflies left that does that hybrid, that, that, that traveling down south, similar to the, uh, similar to the birds. Um, so there are many other states and many other uh, countries right now that are putting money into this and all she's simply asking for is a delay, not an elimination, a delay, strictly a delay. And I think that's important to identify and it's important to identify that it's not the first cutting. First cutting will happen, it's the second cutting. Usually when we don't have all that much rain and usually the plants that do grow are very hardy and because they belong to this area. So, Thank you. Mr. Hansen, do you care to comment on the issue? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we work with the uh, uh, Environmental Advisory Committee. We have staff on the committee and we're very cognizant of the issues. Uh, it's really, this issue is really at the pleasure of council to decide how they want to move forward with this. We, we would recommend that uh, consideration given to, given to getting consensus from the public, obviously, and, and the committee has agreed to do that. Getting consensus for the people that are impacted by the roadside mowing. For us, the issue is simple. Uh, the contractor, we can set out the limits on these three roads where we don't cut for the second cut. It's not an issue for us or for the contractor. So that certainly can be covered. So it's just a matter of getting the consensus on there. I think Councillor Bodner has recognized some of the issues we'd be concerned with from a risk management point of view. We get calls every summer about the trail and to ensure that people using the trail as they come up to these crossing roads, roads have a clear sight of view of the vehicles coming in each direction. We're always asked to cut these uh, roadsides back at the trails. And again, that could be incorporated into the pilot area so that perhaps we cut both sides of the road at the trails themselves for a couple hundred feet. And that would be acknowledged that we do that. Again, it's not a problem for us. We'll just have our contractor come in here and we'll set the limits for them. So really, it's at the pleasure of council now. Uh, if you want to wait till the consensus comes back from the public that are there, we'd be happy to write a report on it. If that's not necessary and council wishes to proceed, that's certainly an option for you as well. Any comment of our delegation this evening? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, may I suggest that you, there's a third option, and that is that you proceed with your, the, uh, Mr. Hansen proceed to put together the report that you feel you may need from a risk perspective. If we could begin to uh, speak to the neighbors and the farmers right now and gather that information, that would give you, Mr. Hansen, a more substantive base to uh, think about specs for the cutting itself. So I think that would be, uh, I would recommend that to your consideration that both things proceed and, and it's going to come back to you anyway for a final decision. And that way you'll have the best information base uh, possible to uh, make a decision. Fine. Uh, whatever options we take, it's still moving forward. And uh, I think that's good. Uh, 
starting to interview the, uh, the, the residents of the area, um, I would suggest uh, that we, council might consider referring this matter back to staff for, for a full report if someone wishes to make that motion. Councilor Doucette. Go ahead, Councillor Kenny. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Like our recommendation that's in front of us, it says that the following motion be approved by Council that the Environmental Advisory Committee proposed plan to delay roadside cuttings be submitted for Council's consideration. That's number one. Mm -hmm. They are going to go out. Um, they've said they're, they're going to go out and speak to the residents in this area. Uh, we are, we're now taking into consideration um, Councilor Bodner's concerns about uh, the driveways, which uh, um, Mr. Hansen, the acting CAO, has said that they can tell the contractor that we have to take those things into consideration. But we're just delaying, we're delaying, that cutting, that uh, second cutting, the first cutting will still take place. <coughs> so I think that the recommendation the way it is, is okay. The recommendation in front of us is okay. Once we get the information from back from the Environmental Committee, which they will pass on, I believe, to staff, then Mr. Hansen can bring us back that final, final report. But tonight, the way the recommendation reads, I think is sufficient for us to move forward and both move forward both the environmental committee and staff both understand and I think that we're all in agreement that uh, we can move forward with this. Okay, Councilor Doucette and Councilor Rodney. The idea behind it is that when we were at the committee discussing it last month is that we wanted the committee to come and let council know what was going to happen next the fact that they were going to that the committee was going to go out and talk to the individuals one fear i had was that they were going to go out and talk to individuals council themselves had no idea this was happening and then would start getting calls and there was no way you could give them an answer it the uh, I don't think we need to delay the committee's actions. The committee needs to continue because if we're going to do this this year, and it's recommended that we do this this year, we have to start talking to the farmers and to the homeowners now. It's as simple as that. And I believe that, I, believe, I agree with Councillor um, Kenny that this recommendation is strictly to tell us what we're doing and allow them to continue on doing what they're going to do. There is going to be a final report coming here where whether we do it or not, that, that, that hasn't been decided, but at least allow them to go on and continue their work. And that's what's important here. And I believe this recommendation does that. I think there is consensus on that point. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just do we have an idea when that report might be coming back to us? Um, it'd have to be, you know, <laughs> yeah, before the end of May, I would say. Um, it has you, to be before the end of May. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, one month? Yeah. Councillor Kenny, do you want to move that recommendation? The recommendation before us? Um, I believe uh, it was Councillor Bodner that pulled that. Is that not correct? Yes, Councilor it was Councillor Bodner. So I believe he's the one. Uh, Councillor Bodner, can you make Mr. that? Mr. Mayor, that uh, makes the move, uh, the motion, and then we'll have a seconder from there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are we at that stage? Yeah, now, we're at Mr. that Mayor? stage. Okay. Okay, I just touched something and everything disappeared. Sorry. I think, I think it's just the first paragraph there that uh, of the motion, of the suggested motion. Bear with me one second. Have it all ready to go. Can, can I assist you with right uh, my copy? Oh, the Frank's got it. As long as I don't touch anything, I'll be okay. <laughs> 
that the memorandum received from Janice Payton, Executive Assistant DEO on behalf of the Environmental Advisory Committee, re Environmental Advisory Committee motion regarding implementation of the City of Port Coburn's proposed plan to delay roadside cuttings be received, that the following motion be approved by Council, that the Environmental Advisory Committee proposed plan to delay roadside cuttings be submitted to council for consideration. And I believe that's the uh, end of the motion. I don't believe the, uh, the latter part of the, the next sentence uh, should be included. Well, the, the way it's edited, if we pass that as, as I anticipate, Mr. Bonner is going to read um, the council approve the proposed plan to delay roadside cuttings along with supporting documents. I'm not sure that's what we want to do until we receive the final reports from Mr. Hansen as well as the uh, as, it, as well as the group. Mm -hmm. yep. Are you agreed that yes, we delete, I am, but, we delete but, that last sentence? But I guess I would look for advice from the clerk as to do we have to then vote this one down, defeat this, and then Have do clerk? the next one without that? I or do we amend it by deleting? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My recommendation to Council would be to um, put the motion as it is recommended in the agenda on the floor for consideration, and if it's Council's pleasure, they can certainly amend the recommendation or, or vote it down at that time, but at least get it on the floor. And, um, and if, if Council is not in agreement with the second part, then you can take the vote and deny that portion and, and proceed with the first part. Okay, go ahead and read it, uh, Councilor Rodner. I'll go away, Frank. So the last line in that motion is that council approve the proposed plan to delay roadside cuttings along with supporting documents. Is there a seconder for that recommendation? Councilor Demery? Uh, sorry, David, I don't have eyes on the side of my head. <laughs> okay, so moved and seconded. Would I call for a vote? Are there any questions or comments? So we got it. Is there an amendment to the motion? Well, we have to vote this one. Down okay. First. Question to Councillor Butters. Okay, I just want to be clear in my head here. When we first got the um, the presentation from Patty Moss back a few months ago um, about coming up with a way to to uh, you know make the make it more possible for these butterflies to mm -hmm. to be in this area and complete life cycles and protect environments for them. This count, the previous council, not this one, previous one sent it to the environment committee to come up with a plan to be able to do that. So is it the wish of this council now to stall that effort until we get feedback from, from those three roads? Because if it's like, just say for example, the, the, um, the three roads are Instead of being a, an education process, it sound, it's sounding more like, do you like this or do you not like this, and kind of gathering that kind of information. And then somehow, what it happens if it's like 50% say, yeah, let's start do something for the butterflies, and 50% say, take a hike. Then it comes back to this council, and then, then what are, uh, is going to happen? So like a decision was made a few months ago to proceed with a, with a plan. We tasked the Environment Committee to come up with a plan. We worked with our um, staff, with Chris Lee, who's out of Mr. Hansen's department, um, and Janice Payton worked with us, you know, along with that committee. So I'm just trying to get an understanding here, like where people's heads are. Are we just kind of like backtracking now, saying, oh, well, maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't? Um, like, what's the percentage have to be? of people who are on board with this, like, this is a good thing to be doing. Environmentally, this is a good thing to be doing. I think it is doable. I totally agree that we, we need to go out and educate and make sure that people understand the importance of this. Totally get that. This should not happen within a vacuum and certainly not in the vacuum of this room. Um, to me, the part of the committee's job, and it's going to, pro I'm sure going to be uphill battle at point, some point in time to to get the message across that these pollinators play an, an incredibly important role. They, without them, you don't have food, for example. That's really the, the, 
the big long and short of it if you don't kind of take care of these things now. Um, the federal government, I think it was, just recently acknowledged the, the importance of the monarch butterfly and it's actually going to be, has earmarked funding to make sure that, that they don't disappear. So I just kind of want that idea from this council, like what are we, what are we actually doing here? Are we going like backing away and going, oh, maybe we will, maybe we won't? Or are we actually going to support the Environment Committee's plan that we asked them to do to, to move this pilot project forward in a careful, considered manner, which takes into account everything that Councillor Bodner said, everything that Mr. Hansen said about safety issues along the trail, all, all those issues, which we totally need to do. Which, which way is it? Just so, anybody who can enlighten me, happy to hear it. Thank you, Councillor Butters. We have a, a motion moved and seconded. Are there any other speakers on the motion? Councillor Bodner. Councillor Elliott also has his hand up. Maybe you might want to wait till. <laughs> Go ahead. Quick, quick question, and I guess for clarification. So what you're going to say is we're going to pass this right now, and the environmental committee does not even have to go out and pull the residents. They do. They, they do. Have to, they have to go out and talk to the residents. Absolutely. Okay. So that's where I'm confused. If if we're if what you, if you want us to do what you just said you want us to do, and be proactive on this and just do it because it makes environmental sense and everything like that, like let's just do it. Then why are we going to have people go out and knock on doors and pull the people and talk to them? Because if we're just going to do it, we're just going to do it. So why? I don't want to say waste their time to have them go out and knock on doors. I mean, if we're going to run, if we're going to run the pilot project, do you just want to do it and have staff come back and say, "Here's the parameters in in the dangerous spots you got to look out for," or are we going to just do it and still go out and pull the residents and ask their opinion? Because I'm kind of split on how it rolls out. Like, we're going to ask an opinion or we're going to educate people, but we're just going to do it. So tell me what we're going to do. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. Uh, we have a comment from the uh, environmental group. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, I just want to refer you to page two of the, uh, of the re uh, report that we put together. And under the subject public consultation, I just want to review that with you briefly because I think some of these things we did take into consideration ourselves that logistically there would be some issues involved with setting up your contracts with the uh, uh, contractors who, uh, who cut the roads. What we said here is the residential and farming communities adjoining the roads under consideration will have leaflets based upon this staff report uh, distributed to each home. Where possible, members of the committee will answer any questions and take any comments. Where residents are not home, the leaflet will be left in mailboxes together with contact coordinates where farmers and residents can provide comments and have questions answered. Comments received will be summarized for council and city staff to review. And, and obviously, I, I take uh, Councillor Bodner's car comments to heart that we, we need to be especially uh, uh, work hard on this just simply to make sure everybody is spoken to. But the, but the notion that we had was that this information would be summarized, given back to uh, staff and to report it back to council so that you would have the benefit of that when you're reviewing whatever decisions you have to make with the contracting tractors and the like. So I think we did sort of think about this in advance. Um, and we certainly uh, weren't looking for uh, you know complete approval right now because there may be something come up in the consultations that, that we have not anticipated and want to get back to you as the decision maker to uh, have uh, available to you when you make your decision. Councillor Bodner, you still had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I'm kind of on the same line as Councillor Elliott, where what are the rules of the game? If we're just, um, you know, are we going to, if somebody wants, okay, just to get back to, to when the weeds are going to be cut. They're going to be cut early June and then not until October something. Is that what the report said? Sorry, I, I'm thinking that's what it was. October something. If you have a wet summer, <laughs> the weeds are going to grow considerably high 
by October something, whatever it is, second or towards the end of October. So if somebody wants before the August long weekend? I, that would be the second cutting, <clears throat> Mr. Bonner? I'm, I'm asking, cut, yeah. It wouldn't be cut until October. I'm, anyways, if it is October, if it's in August, then you don't have very long for those butterflies no. to no, do their thing, right? Mr. I'm pretty sure it's October, but. A calling for clarification from Mr. Hanson, please. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. The committee has recommended that the second cut be not done and the second cut actually be done in October. Right. So that the cutting for the growing season would be from the end of May till October. Yeah. So, so that's still quite a bit of time for those weeds to grow if we have a wet summer. I guess what I'm looking for is after you go out and tell everybody, you know, everybody says, yeah, we'll give this a try or whatever. So somebody's driveway is obstructed by weeds. It's a wet summer or whatever. So we've instructed our cutter not to cut anything on that road. Are we going to then go in and cut a certain length besides somebody's driveway? There's got to be some rules. And I think people would like to know that when you go out and you're talking to them and they're going to say, well, hold it now. How far are you going to uh, cut uh, from my driveway so I can see good? And you're going to say, don't worry, we're going to take care of it. That just might not fly, you know. If you're going to say we'll cut 20 feet on each side of your driveway, now somebody can understand. If they don't know the rules, I don't know how, much, how good a response you're going to get. So I don't know if we're chasing our tail here or what. I just want it to work. But if you don't go out right, it's not going to work, or it's, you're going to be tripping over yourself. So, you, I'd appreciate, uh, Mr. Bonner, that if you were to cut 20 feet on the side of, other side of a driveway, uh, our costs uh, of uh, our contractor are, are going to be uh, certainly increased. Duzette. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Maybe this is for Patty Moss. She would be the one that would be. Patty, can you come and answer this question uh, through you, sir, to Patty? If I remember right, I heard you say that you wanted only the one side of the ditch left, which is the one side that we usually cut. The other side of the ditch, usually someone else takes care of it. Is that? Did I misunderstand that? The cuttings that we're talking about. Press on the middle button there. Thank you. All I'm referring to is what the city is responsible for cutting. Okay. That's the only area I'm referring to. As well as just making note what Rod Bonner was, uh, Ron Bonner was bringing up regarding the, the cuttings. A lot of municipalities in Ontario actually do two cuttings. So there are municipalities out there in Ontario, especially rural areas, that uh, only do two cuttings. So instead of being worried about how big the weeds are, well, they could be big, but we don't know. This is something, when's the last time have we observed this? Who has observed our roadsides, really? Yes, and depending on if it's a wet, rainy summer, yeah, plants are going to grow longer, taller. But that's why, we're, why I'm saying let's do a trial period. Let's watch. Let's see. Let's see what happens. There are a lot of benefits to this other than butterflies. Like uh, Arbor's, Butters was mentioning pollinators. That's a, that's a big, big concern of us and should be a concern of everyone, even farmers. Now, I'm going to touch base with this down the road, but I've been in contact with professors down at Iowa State University, and he's doing s studies of uh, soybeans and pollinators, the effect of pollinators on soybeans. So he's starting that this year. So this is a win situation for farmers and residents and for future generations. Yeah, there's a lot of questions and there's going to be a lot of worries because it's something new and different and people aren't sure. But we have to think back what our roads used to look like in the past. And we managed 40 years ago, 50 years ago. I'm sure we didn't cut it three times a year. I, I'm just all I'm asking is just for a trial location. Let me go out there and talk to the residents. I think that's a key thing. Let's talk to the people that live on the roads and then let's move forward from that. All, I'm, all we're looking for is just approval to come out with this plan that we've done, done with 
to present it to you, is get the okay to bring it out and go to residents and talk to them. And let's bring it back to the table. If I have a sheet long, people are upset and all the you'll definitely hear from them as well. And let's discuss it and say, well, maybe this isn't a good idea. What else can we do? And then we can look into other options that you did mention, Ron. Okay. Thank you very much, Penny. She Thank said you. it all. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Demaray, did you have a comment or question? Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was just going to suggest that we approve work done so thus far, ask that uh, this come back to council uh, yet another time with the uh, rules and regulations put into it uh, so that we could see it. But approval of the work done thus far would allow you to go talk to the residents. W would that be OK? It's just the way the motion is written, it is rather confusing, and it, it doesn't make sense. So possibly we could just do that. So, as I understand it, we can we have a motion moved and seconded on the floor. We can proceed. I could call a question. We could have this motion withdrawn, so, or well, or deferred to uh, perhaps to the next council meeting to, for more information. All right, I, people are ready. I'm calling the question. All those in favor? All those opposed? Defeated. Is there a new motion that someone wishes to propose? Madam Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, I've lost it now. You're not the only one, Ron. <laughs> there it is. Okay. All right. So, that the following motion be approved by council. That the Environmental uh, Advisory Committee's proposed plan to delay roadside cutting be accepted in, uh, sorry, be approved for the work that done thus far, um, and that the motion be returned to council at, the, at a subsequent meeting with the rules and regulations added. Can I do it? Something to that essence? And, and, the public input. And, and the public input, sorry, yes, that's, that's yeah. Is that okay? That thereby allowing the committee to go out and poll the residents. Right. Do you want the preamble? Okay. For, clar for clarity, I would request the, the clerk to read out that motion as best she can. Now listen carefully. You just got a smile on Thank you, Mr. Mayor that the Environmental Advisory Committee proposed plan to delay roadside cuttings be approved for the work done thus far and that the motion be presented at a subsequent council meeting uh, to present the rules, the applicable rules and res regulations as well as results from public consultation. Does everyone understand the motion? Yes. Any questions? <laughs> Councilor Elliott. <laughs> the seconder on that motion? All seconded. And then I'll come. How's that? <laughs> Mr. Elliott, you have the floor. So now we're, now we're back to polling the, the people again. That's, uh, and that's why. I've got no problem approving this. Let's move forward with it. The only thing I'm trying to alleviate is what your committee is going to do. Are we going to go out? I don't want you to go, out and go door to door and say, do you approve of this? Yes or no? and say, this is what we're gonna do, do you approve, yes or no, information and your approval, yes. Go to the next one, this is what we're gonna do as an information, education, do you approve, yes or no, and then come back and say, well, half the people said yes and half the people said no. Everybody gets it and understands it, so here you go, it's 50-50, now we get to make the decision. Mm -hmm. oh. And that's where we're back to Barb, what you were saying, like let's, we're all in or we're all out, so I'm just trying to, make it easier for the committee that's going to go door to door and say, this is strictly educational, here you are, this is going to happen because we want it to happen, or are you looking for a response from the residents that say, yes, we do want it, or no, we don't? Because that seems to be where we're at again. So clarify that for me. Councillor Butters. You know what, Councillor Elliott? Maybe that's, maybe that's what's going to happen. But my thought process is this. 
is that once the committee gets together a leaflet in kind of a package for residents and gives them uh, numbers that they can call and talk to people, I think that, I personally think that people will buy into giving this a chance. If they're giving, given the information to be able to look at and make an informed decision. And if they can have their um, difficulties addressed, whether it's you know, in the trail areas to make sure that the safety issues are, are dealt with. Because I think if anybody's going to be worried about something, it would be a safety issue as opposed to an aesthetic issue. At least I would hope so. Um, so to me, it's like the only way to move forward is just to get one foot in front of the other. And, and to me, I think Angie's um, motion makes sense and it allows the committee to move forward. And, and um, as George said, like if it all comes down to like it's just going to be a big um, parade, then maybe we have to look at another way to do it. But I'm, hope, I'm really hopeful that we won't have to do that, that we will be able to, to, to um, give people the information that they require and address whatever concerns they may have in a responsible way that makes sense. So is that fair? Madam Demery, you had a comment through the chair? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I was just going to say basically what Councillor Butters just said. It, the, by having rules and regulations built into the, to the motion, it allows staff to put whatever they need in there and the committee to go out and implement it, and then we'll have what we want in the end. Uh, we can end it up with a public meeting if you like, but staff can determine that. I really think it's time that we move forward to this uh, motion. Mr. Bonner, call a question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Was that unanimously? It was. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on to uh, it looks like item number seven, uh, Mr. Three. 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 Mr. Elliott, that was yours. That was mine. Thank you, Mayor. We'll try to make this one a little bit shorter. Oh, and I got to read half the column. Go for it. Department of Community and Corporate Services, Community Services Division Report Number 2015-37, Subject Community Services Schedule of Fees and Rates for 2015. A, that the Council of the Corporation of the City of Port Coburn approves the schedule of fees and rates for the following facilities as per the attached appendices as Schedule A for A to J for 2015. A Valley Health and Wellness Center is listed in Schedule A, B Advertising as listed in Schedule B, C Recreation Programs is listed in Schedule C, D Parks and Pavilions is listed in Schedule D, E Playing Fields and Sports Courts is listed in Schedule E, F Commemorative Markers is listed in Schedule F, G Nickel Beach is listed in Schedule G, H Roselawn Center is <laughs> listed in Schedule H, I Sugarloaf Marina is listed in Schedule I, and J Special Event Services is listed in Schedule J, B that the appropriate facility fees and rates bylaw be prepared by the municipal clerk and presented to the council for approval. See that the council of the corporation of the city of Port Coburn approves staff to investigate additional advertising and sponsorship opportunities within the Valley Health and Wellness Center. D that the council of the corporation of the city of Port Coburn approved the establishment of a capital reserve for boat launch ramp of 10% of the ramp revenues for future capital enhancements for the boat ramp. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there a, a, a seconder for that? Monsieur Doucette? Mm -hmm. Discussion? Mr. Elliott. This won't take as long as reading that did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. Um, just a couple quick questions. Um, with regards to the increase in the, in the, in the rates at 2.1%, which is cost of living, I get that. Um, does the cost of living cover our increase in operating costs? That's what I'm looking for. How much extra revenue does this um, proposal going to garner us for 2015? And where are we with the level of subsidy right now? And I guess the report does state that it wants to see us stay within a certain parameter of a level of subsidy. Who's deciding what the level of subsidy is? Where were we when we had three standalones? Where are we in one brand new facility now? And what's the acceptable level of subsidy that we're looking to maintain going forward? Does the 2.1 cost of living increase keep us within that defined level? And is it uh, safe to say that the cost of living increase year over keep us within that level? Or do we 
have to increase more than the cost of living because our expenses for operating exceed 2.1 year over year. And I know that's a big question, so Peter, if you can answer, answer those. Hakeem. Go ahead. Can I get Harry to answer that one? Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> to you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, that's a big question. Um, you mentioned what our, I think you're referring to what the, the level of tax subsidy on our recreation facility, the three, two arenas and a pool that we used to have versus the Valley Center that we have today. Um, the subsidy was roughly around 700000 prior to Valley Center. Um, if you remember last year's budget, we were at um, about a million. Um, bigger facility, um, larger expenses. The whole idea was that um, over a period of time, we're trying to uh, reduce that down uh, through a couple of means. One is increasing um, uh, programs, increasing rentals, and so on. Um, over a period of time because we know that it does take time to get things moving. Um, increasing fees to get fees that are reasonable but not out of extraordinary that uh, people aren't going to uh, come to the programs, not going to rent the things. So the, the fees that, um, that Mr. Akeem is proposing is uh, to increase the revenues on that side um, which is at the, around the cost of living. Um, our expenditures are are, are um, at around the cost of living because our overall budget is, is, is at that. Um, we are coming out of a warranty period uh, on some of the items um, at the Valley Center. Um, so we've tried to build that type of thing into the expenses. Um, so whereas warranty comes out, um, you know, other expenses may come up if, if there are uh, things happen that are out of warranty. So we've tried to compensate for all of that. Um, so we're probably at around the same type of subsidy. The other thing is we're, we're, we're uh, looking at we'll actually there'll be a, uh, the YMCA will be coming uh, at the next council meeting to prov provide their annual report as to how they did. Um, so I, I don't think I want to take it away from them uh, to, to announce you know sort of where they're at. Um, it is a good news story, so that so that's good. Um, and we're looking at slowly trying to reduce their um, the the operating. Um, amount that's provided to the YMCA. So all of those things sort of coming together, um, we're, you know, again, we're still only finished the, I guess, the, really the first full year of operation um, and budgeting for the second full year and um, be able to then tweak as we go along. And I think that uh, in this year's budget coming, um, we've tried to tweak it, bringing in some realistic expenditures, knowing where we we're in the first year and where we're going and also with our revenues and trying to increase our revenues to that extent and especially the ice rental revenues we know the plan was to increase those um, over a period of two or three years to get them to a level that we believe is sustainable hopefully that answers that question yeah, that's that's great they got them got them all and, and that was that's my only concern is is what level of subsidy are, are we looking at and do we want to maintain and if we're just going to look at cost of living increases year over, is that sustainable in maintaining the level of subsidy that we're at? Um, I don't know, you know, with heat hydro and wages, the increases exceed the cost of living allowance. Um, you know, if it does, I don't want to be behind and try to recapture that at a later date if we can monitor it to make sure that, that the 2.1% increase is always going to leave us at a, a comfort level of sub subsidy, whatever that level is. It may not even be what we're at now. We might want to reduce that depending on that good news story that's coming. Um, keep your fingers crossed. Or other forms of revenue. I mean, you know, it does state that there's other forms that, uh, that we're looking at. And I guess the biggest question to, to Harry would be uh, forms of revenue. We don't have rink board advertising. We did before. We don't, any, we don't now. Is that completely forever off the table, or are we looking at that at some point? Take it away, Peter. Great, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Three, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Elliott. Um, yes, we definitely put that in as part of the recognition report so that um, we can look at other types of um, revenue opportunities because of the fact that we know that we want to reduce that, that, that amount of tax subsidy <coughs> over a period of time. And in the initial stages, we're looking at the types of revenue that we have now. Um, other types of revenue and understanding 
um, if we want to increase revenues it may be a proposal that may come back to council I know we brought it to council once before about um, other types of revenue including the advertising on rink boards on the walls and things like that we know we have um, a lot of businesses that have been knocking on our door saying hey I'd love to advertise um, but that'll be a decision of council as to whether or not they want to change that that decision going forward um, based on you know um, our, our financial situation in that as to whether or not it's worthwhile doing that type of advertising and increasing our revenue base uh, going forward so it'll it'll be that'll be something that'll come back to council again but it, again it'll be council's decision and because we're looking at every avenue that we can to to uh, increase the revenues uh, at the facility Mr. Elliott, are you finished sir any other questions on my left any questions on my right mr. Maine <coughs> through mr. mayor to uh, mr. McKean. <clears throat> I'm all worked up here about this uh, butterfly stuff. I can't get it out of my throat. <laughs> but anyway, uh, how's the butterfly going to cross the road? <laughs> but anyhow, uh, the Pokemon recognition part, and uh, Harry and I talked about it uh, earlier, and I would like to ma have him make a comment uh, publicly. Uh, we, uh, we were talking about this originally. Uh, we figured a boat is a boat, doesn't matter whether it's a 14 foot boat or a 40 foot boat. And I think the fee should be the same for regardless of what size boat it is. Because uh, uh, if you talk to the fellows in the Pokemon, it's usually the boats that are under 20 feet that, that do the calling for rescue of the Pokemon. And the ones over 20 feet, as a rule, don't because they can take the bigger waves. They're a safer boat. And uh, usually the guys with the 40 foot boats have full tanks and the guys with 20-foot boats uh, don't have full tanks. So I'd, I'd like you just to make a comment on that, Harry, please, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, through your worship to uh, Councillor Maine. Um, when we looked at this originally, we wanted to come up with a, a simple way to collect fees, reconcile, and then it was discussed amongst us, and we came up with a 1% margin for seasonal bullers, which appears fair because it's across the board. Statistically, he's probably correct, and we didn't really get into any major consultation with anyone until this report came forward to Council. So we can tweak this and meet halfway or come up with a scheme that perhaps might be a little bit more advantageous where there's a fee across the board. We, this particular fee, I think the transient fee we're comfortable with, the way we've uh, work that out. I'm not sure you didn't bring that forward, but I'm bringing it forward in a sense that I think that's the one we struggled with, but it came uh, through a percentage system for us to look at capturing the fee and then sharing that fee uh, in recognition for Pokemar as well as for the uh, marina, recovering that 50% as part of a capital recovery charge. So we can tweak that one seasonal voter fee if that's what you're asking. Mr. Bain? To you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to Mr. McKean. I, I did look at the transient docks, and the way I look at the transient docks is they're, they're boaters who don't pay taxes in the city of Port Colbert. They're passing through, whereas the boaters who usually have their boats at the marina are residents or, or their boats. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you with the transients uh, by all means, and that's still a fair price because uh, whenever we sail anywhere in the lakes, that's still you're in the ballpark. It's a very fair price. Any other questions or comments? There being none, we have moved and seconded. The call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried unanim unanimously. Mr. Elliott, item number six, you're up on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if it would be Council's pleasure, if I could do six and seven together, my questions are the same for both items. If, if that's allowable, if the clerk would allow that, can we talk to two items or yes or no? That would be the pleasure of Council to combine those if Council uh, would like uh, to have them dealt with separately or 
together. Just so um, it's the same thing, and my my questions are exactly the same for both items, because both items are deal with the same issue. If and, and I will read both. We would still have to vote on each one. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't mind that separate votes, but just for discussion purposes, my right, questions why, why are the we, same. Why don't we call both motions at the same time? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then apply the discussion of Mr. Elliott to vote. Does that be acceptable yeah, to council? Will, and I will ask for council's approval to speak to both at the same time. Yeah? Do we need a motion for that matter for just consensus? Doesn't appear there's any objections. Uh, uh, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Hanson. Um, is there any logistical reason why we can't do that? I, I, I want to make sure that we can before we say we should, or we will. That's all I'm saying. Through you to Mr. Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It, it's at the pleasure of council. Uh, okay. Either yeah. motion. Okay. There's consensus that we combine. Sure. Yeah. Yep. We'll move them, both motions. The discussion will be combined. Yep. yep. Um, so item six is, uh, whereas the Council of the City of Port Coburn has the authority to extend existing contracts and mutual agreement with the contractor, it is recommended that Council accepts the offer of Circle P paving of Stevensville, Ontario and extend their current contract for an additional two years with pricing in 2015 to match that as previously offered by them in 2014, along with additional pricing being offered for 2016 at a rate 3% greater than the rate offered for 2015 to that all costs associated with these works be covered by the annually approved road construction budgets for each of the appropriate years having GL number 3-550-33129-3328. And item seven. Just for, I just have a second for that second. motion. Second. Seconded by Mr. Danch. Now item number seven, Mr. Sorry. Elliott. Uh, whereas the council of the city of Port Coburn has the authority to extend existing contracts and mutual agreement with a contractor, it is recommended that council accept the offer of provincial road markings of Niagara Falls, Ontario and extend their current contract for an additional, an additional one year, with pricing in 2015 to match that as previously offered by them in 2014. Two, that all costs associated with these works to be covered under the approved 2015 pavement markings budget having GL number 0 500 74210 There's a seconder for that. Councilor Dash. Discussion. Mr. Elliott, you have comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just real quick, I had brought an, an issue up, I think it was last year, with uh, towards unsolicited bids, which basically it is. They're asking to renew their contract, which I, which I think is great because we didn't go out to the public. We're getting great rates with companies that we know um, and we're happy with their work, which saves us the time and energy of drafting everything up and waiting for the, the bids to come in. Um, I guess the quick question is, Ron, how much for each of the contracts and how satisfied are you that we don't have to go out because their, their value for work is, is obvious? Mr. Hanson? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we, can, we can honestly say that both these contractors have performed very well in the past. That's the first thing. Uh, the, the prices, uh, the increase for pavement marking is zero. So of course that's a good deal. It costs a few thousand dollars in every contract to, to go out to tender, put the documents together. Advertising is very expensive, six to seven hundred dollars uh, to put an ad in the paper. So that gets expensive well. So there's a substantial saving in terms of the tendering cost. In both cases with both these contracts, we have contractors who have performed this work many years in the past, Circle P paving and um, provincial pavement markings. So. Uh, with the, the nominal increases that they're offering us, in the case of uh, provincial, no increase. In the case of Circle P paving, uh, basically a percent and a half a year over two years. So uh, it's a good deal for the municipality and both good contractors have performed the work quite well. Jelly? Thank you, Mr. Hanson. And, and, and I like the fact that I'm, I'm assuming that they approached us to renew their contracts. Um, like I said, I, ha I had brought this up. The region actually was going to put forth a bylaw to change their, their practice of accepting unsolicited bids for 
works or materials or whatever the public saw that maybe they could offer. And I know that the CAO was absent at this time said it was different from our municipality with regards to the region and the way that they operate. I'd still like to see that, that if there's something in the city that, that an outside source sees as a source of revenue for us or something that they can do better than we can do and comes to us unsolicited and says, I'll give you X number of dollars for this service or to buy this or to offer you that, I think we should be able to put that out there. I think this is great. It saves us money. We're happy with the work that they've done. At first when I read it, I was kind of like, oh, you know, I really like to go to tender to see if we can get a better price. But in this circumstance, we've got good contractors that are well known by us that do good work. Let's just keep rolling along. And, and like the report says, we get a jump on things earlier in the year because they're already signed up and ready to go. So the reason I, I, I pulled it was for that was for twofold to, to, to find out how they came to do that. And also to say, you know, maybe we should look at this in the future that if somebody wants to make a bid that we don't have a tender out for, that we might entertain it. I know that the region had some parameters in which it was going to operate under, uh, whether a bid come in and then you would have to advertise it publicly that you received a bid for said service or whatever it was they were bidding on to see if anybody else wanted to take a crack at it. Um, I like that, I like that, that, that form that maybe we don't see things that we should see, that the public does, that wants to come to us and say, you know, I know you guys do this, but I could do it cheaper. Here's my bid on it if you're interested. And just see what happens. So I, I'm glad that this came, and I'm glad that we're saving money. I like the pricing structure that they've offered us, so it's a, it's a win-win. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. Uh, Mr. Hampson, do you have a comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just for clarification for Council, we've only entertained this type of... Um, bidding in terms of an extension of an existing contract. <coughs> Purchasing policy requires that given the uh, amount of the work that's required, we have to go to a public tender or public quotation depending on the amount of the purchase of services. So we don't do unsolicited bidding for anything larger uh, than is required on the reimbursement policy or the, I'm sorry, the purchasing policy. So this is in both cases here is simply an extension of an existing contract that we already have in place. Just for that clarification. Any further questions or comments on items number six and seven? There being none, I'd call for the question on item number six. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Number seven, call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item number eight, Councillor Kenny. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Department of Chief Administrative Officer, Special Projects and Corporate Strategic Initiatives Division, Report 2015-42, Subject 10-Year Lease Renewal Between Godridge Elevators Limited and the City of Port Colvin for the Port Colvin Green Elevator. Recommendation staff recommends that Council approve the proposed lease dated January the 1st, 2015 between the City of Port Colvin and Godridge Elevators Limited, and further that all additional funds received under the new lease terms be placed in a reserve for a future demolition of the elevator when it is no longer in use. Is there a seconder for that uh, recommendation? Councillor DeMary? Comments? Councillor Kenny? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, please, to um, Mr. to Mr. Sinez. Um, Peter, um, I guess I had some concerns when I read that uh, the current reserve stands at uh, 100, uh, sorry, 813,000, while the estimated cost to demolish the elevator, um, 2.59 million, less the potential in salvage deal, which cre creates a a liability for the city of approximately 1.9 million. Now, when I read the report, um, it looked like there was money in a reserve at one point in time. Uh, the um, it says the current lease um, started in December 20th, 2002, and was for a period of 14 years, expiring um, in July uh, 2015, and. Um, Though they've had a, uh, an assessment um, less from impact, 
that re resulted in us getting less taxes. What I want to know, um, Mr. Sinez, is there, are there any possibility, because also it says that we've increased our maintenance uh, to this facility from an annual $25,000 contribution to $85,000 <coughs> annually. So how are we ever going to get enough money in that reserve to build that up so that if there was, if it had to be demolished, that there's going to be money there. At the current rate that we're bringing in, is that, is that even feasible or is that just, we're just bringing money in and putting it there and hoping they just keep operating and we never have to demolish it? Treasurer Sanes. Through Mr. Mayor, Councillor Kenny. Um, you're correct, there is, there is a reserve. Um, it's roughly just over $800,000 in the reserve. Um, it has been increasing, um, it's invested, so it is increasing with regard to interest being earned on that. The additional revenue from the lease, the increased uh, uh, lease payments uh, is going to go into that account uh, along with interest and then anything else that we've received for, for the throughput uh, fees that, that do come through. Um, it'll take a while to build back up, to, to build up to that 1.9 million. We spent Originally, that, that reserve was at about 1.6 million uh, when we first got it. But we did spend uh, over the years about a uh, million dollars, about 750 or so thousand dollars to remove the uh, uh, the, the the legs or <coughs> marine legs um, off the as you, as as council knows. So that that really took a, a re real chunk out of out of that reserve. Um, so we're trying to replace it with with that. Um, that's one point in time. We've been trying to decide: can should we take that full lease amount, the hundred and thirty thousand dollars, take it out of the levy and put it into the reserve on an annual basis? The unfortunate part is that's going to add one percent to your to the tax levy, um, so that's going to be tough to do. Um, so any residual that we're receiving, we'll be putting into there. Um, obviously, the the lease is a long-term lease, and uh, with them staying there um, and continuing. Um, over the years, uh, we won't have to demolish that at any point in time. Um, the only time we'd have to demolish it is if they decided to go out of business and move, and, and we had that there, and then it would be a decision of council as to when and how we we uh, demolish it at that point in time. So, it, I, I would imagine it. We're you know we're looking at sometime in the future. So in the meantime, we'll continue to try to put as much as we can back into that reserve and, and build that reserve up over the future. As far as the um, the uh, the operating part of it, that eighty five thousand, that is part of the operating budget, our operating budget. So it's it's in it's in our operating budget. So it's not coming out of that eight hundred thousand. So there's no reduction to it, uh, unless we have to put do something else major with that facility in in the future. Councilor Kenny. Thank you again through you to Peter. Peter, are we um, obligated to demolish this building? Or can it just sit empty like the former uh, Robin Hood building? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that would be something we'd have, to, we'd have to look into the actual agreement that we had with Ports Canada as to whether or not it was an obligation or because I know that our obligation with Ports Canada is, is completed. Um, and basically, it, 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 it's, it's, it's our facility now. They have no um, claim to it, I guess, if you want to call it that. So I think it would, it would end up being our decision, but we just have to double check on the uh, agreement. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Bodner, then Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Hansen, I think. Um, Ron, um, we had made a deal with, I think it was Talk Wireless, to put um, their receivers on the outside of that building. Can you tell us if that had anything to do with Godrich? Do so they get any money out of that, or is that simply a deal between the city and uh, Talk Wireless? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, th that uh, agreement to put the antenna, uh, the um, receivers on the roof of the Godrich elevator, had no impact on Godrich. It's not included in the Goddard Agreement, it's simply a, an agreement between the City of Port Coburn and the uh, wireless provider. So it's not included in this agreement you see in front of me. Mr. Martin, go ahead. 
Mr. Mayor, through you to Mr. Hansen again. Um, you see in the report that uh, Godrich went to MPAC and uh, had their taxes reduced because they weren't using, I think they call it the annex or something, a, a section of the building. Um, is there any opportunity for the city to use that if it's sitting vacant? Have we thought about that or is it, you know, it, it's obviously there and, and they're not using it. I just wondered what, I can't remember exactly what it looks like or if it's any use to us. So I wonder if you could answer that. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The annex is a, is a portion of the building that's, that's uh, vac vacant now. It's not used by the Goddard operation. It represents about a third of the footprint of the building itself. So that's why MPAC, with the, with the application MPAC, was able to uh, reduce the assessment based on that one-third reduction. I don't think the city has ever looked at the feasibility of using that building. It's quite old. It's, uh, it's a different type of building. If you ever toured it, it's, it's like going through an old museum in time. Uh, it's an interesting building. It'll be really a challenge to take down, I would think, in the future if we ever have to do that. But uh, the feasibility of use of that has never been looked at. It's certainly something we could talk to the current uh, Godrich operator and, and see if there's any uh, way to combine our efforts on that, see if there's any use for it for the city. Mr. Potter. Mr. Mayor, I wonder whether we could just casually ask staff to look at that at some point. I mean, it may, like Ron said, just be space that is so bizarre you can't use it for anything but it's a big chunk of building and maybe maybe we can use it let's get creative you know might be able to come up with some uh no i won't say what i thought no just see if we can use it for anything you're asking for a report <laughs> from uh, staff well, um it doesn't have to be a full-blown report if they go in there and have a look at it um even take some pictures so we can see what it looks like i've been in there but i can't really remember exactly what part they're talking about but you know if there's something they can do without spending a horrendous amount of money, just to uh, give us a thought and uh, what it might be used for, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Hansen, you think you're going to address Mr. Sure. Bodner's concerns? No problem. Thanks, Mr. Bodner, for those points. Councilor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to uh, Peter. Page 81 of the report. Um, I believe it's 81. It talks about the throughput. And um, we charge 75 cents for uh, all tons between 150,000 and not more than 200,000, if any, multiplied by 75 cents. And the grain throughput for the lease year in excess of 200,000 tons, if any, multiplied by $1.50. When you look at the financial chart on 116, um, we only collected that in one year. And I'm just wondering. Is that a negotiated uh, tonnage that uh, that they want to pay on the 150 to 200 or anything over 200? Because it shows the throughput. Uh, we only got any money in um, 2011 was 34 thousand dollars, so there's only revenue off that in one year. And also, if you look at the line below it, the uh, the birth is wharfage seems to be a line that has diminishing returns. 08 was 11.2, then we increased up to 18,000. We got 60 in 210, 19 in 211, and then 5,500 in 2012, 10 up in 10,000 in 213, and now we're down to $6,200 last year. Um, is that a result of, of their downturn of business? And I guess, and, and back to the first one, the throughput for grain. Um, is that a level that uh, that they put forward that they would pay on, and is that uh, something that's negotiated through the lease? To yes, and yes. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as far as the the um, the tonnage and, and the rates there, those were established um, at the with the original lease that that was brought forward from Ports Canada, and um, and that continued, and and I believe that those tonnages and so on are based on. Um, the, the business case of uh, the grain market, um, so that's that's what those are based on originally. Um, as far as the throughput and the wharfage fees that we do receive, again, it's it it all depends on the operations um, of each year and uh, the market of the grain and what 
flows through um, their elevators each year. So it's all market driven um, as to what does go through the, uh, the green elevators. And some years is better than other years. And, uh, and that's what drives those, those prices and the amounts that we do receive. So they do fluctuate and they're up and down based on, on their, their operations and the market conditions. Any other questions? There being none, call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item number nine, Mr. Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Whereas the Council of the City of Port Coburn has the authority to extend existing contracts in mutual agreement with a contractor, it is recommended that Council accept the offer of Lawns and more of Ridgeway, Ontario, and extend their current contract, 2013-12, citywide bylaw grass mowing for an additional two years with pricing in 2015 to match that as previously offered by them in 2014 along with additional pricing being offered for 2016 at a rate 5% greater than the rate offered for 2015. That all costs associated with these works be recovered by a recharge amount from the affected properties. Is there a seconder for that motion? Mr. Elliott, further comment, Mr. Bodner? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Hanson, I, I pulled this originally because we were talking about the butterfly uh, roadside cutting along with, with this, and I just wonder how this might affect our, um, our contract here if we're not going to do some of those cuts or postpone them. Uh, is there any effect on that, and, you know, is, or is it status quo? Mr. Hanson oh. or Mr. Aguilina. Mr. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner. This deals with residential properties uh, okay. in the urban area. All right. We don't have roadside. We don't have uh, grass cutting out in the agricultural rural area. This is urban area only. Okay. So it has no bearing on what we heard earlier this evening. No butterflies in the downtown core, apparently. So. Right. We're good. Sorry. Misunderstood. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? There be none. Call for the question. All those in favor? All those opposed? Carried. Item number 11, Mr. Elliott. Let me get down to it. Was it 11? Oh, the only reason I pulled it was for the conflict, so. Uh, <laughs> but that's okay. you can I'll defer to anybody else that would care to read it. Do you have to read the whole thing? <sighs> Item 11. Church and Shores re request for permission to hold weekly fireworks display events for 2015 that pursuant to section uh, 6.11 of bylaw 498. Six nine. Let me make it big enough that I can read it. Four nine eight nine dash forty five dash oh seven. The Council of the Corporation of the City of Port Coburn authorized Shirks the Shores to hold display fireworks events on the following dates as listed below. Or do I have to read every one? I should read every one. <clears throat> no wonder you called a conflict. Saturday, June the twentieth, two thousand fifteen. Saturday, June the twenty seventh, two thousand fifteen. Saturday, July the fourth. 2015. Don't miss that. The 4th of July should be ex extravaganza. Saturday, July the 11th, 2015. Saturday, July the 18th, 2015. Saturday, July 25th, 2015. Saturday, August 1st, 2015. Saturday, August 8th, 2015. Saturday, August 15th, 2015. Saturday, August 22nd, 2015. Saturday, August 29th, 2015. Saturday, September the 5th, 2015. That such approval be conditional on the issuance of a permit by the fire chief in compliance with bylaw 4989-45-07 and payment of applicable fees. Let the following information be submitted to the Port Coburn Fire and Emergency Services for a review a minimum of two weeks prior to the holding of the first event. 
a fireworks site plan, but not limited to separation distances to the public and vulnerable areas, location from where the fireworks are being fired, fallout zone and direction of firing, information concerning the floating platform from which the fireworks are to be fired, including the platform size, event description information is required, including description of fireworks, type size and quantity, firing procedures, manual or electric, emergency <coughs> procedures, traffic control plans, that Shirks and Shores be advised that as the authority having jurisdiction, Port Coburn Fire and Emergency Services will conduct spot site inve inspections and may, I would assume that says, may revoke approval for any violation of the Ontario Fire Code or the Explosives Act prior to or during any one of the scheduled events. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Elliott. Do you have any further comments on? I have no comments because I'm out of gas and I only pull it for the conflict. So, no other comments. We're all good. Call for a question. All those in favor? Oh, I thought there was a seconder. Mr. Elliott and Mr. Hearn. Who's that? No further discussion or comments. Call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Number 12. That's Mr. Bodner. That's already, that's already done? Okay, that's right. We, we uh, let them go first. Okay. Are there any notices? A motion, Madam Clerk. I have none. Any member of council having a notice of motion? If there being none, I just look up, point out the following upcoming meetings of the whole and council meetings of Monday, March 23rd, Committee of the Whole, Monday, April 13th, Committee of the Whole and Council, Mo April 27th, Committee of the Whole and Council, Monday, May 11th, Committee of the Whole and Council, and Monday, May 25th, Committee of the Whole and Council. And on yes. That's already been mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Desat. There being no further business, uh, I'll call for a motion to adjourn. Mo moved by <laughs> Councillor Danch. <laughs> Seconded by Councillor May. All in favor? <laughs> Carried. Are we uh, ready to move on to the regular council meeting agenda, or would members of staff require or like a five minute uh, break? There being none, then let's move on. I'd like the call to the meeting to order of the regular council meeting for Monday, March 9th. Are there any addendum items, Madam Clerk? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, none this evening. I would ask for a motion and seconder to confirm the agenda. Moved by Councillor Butter, seconded by Councillor Kenny. All those in favor? Carried. Any disclosures of interest? Yes, Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, item heaven, oh, heaven. 11, as it involves Shirts and Shores, and I have a business inside there, and I'd really like Councillor Elliott to uh, <laughs> be able to read that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bodner. I call for the adoption of the minutes of the seventh meeting regular of council of February 26, 23rd, 2015. Moved by Councillor Butters, seconded by Councillor Main. Any, are there any errors or omissions? Call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Determination of council items requiring separate discussion. It's Councillor Elliott. Item 11 for the conflict. Item 11. Item 11. Could I call for an adoption uh, or motion to adopt the uh, items to requ not requiring separate discussion? Moved by Councillor Doucette, seconded by Councillor Bodner. Any questions, any discussion? If you're being done, call for a motion to accept. Opposed? Carried. 
Are there any proclamations this evening, Madam Clerk? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, none this evening. Thank you. Minutes of Boards and Commission. We have the Minutes of Board of, Management, of Management of the Fort Cohen Historical and Marine Museum of January 20th, 2015. We have a separate, so we wish to deal with uh, an under number seven, deal separately with item number 11. Remover and seconder. You requested that, Mr. Elliott. Item 11. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in light of the fact that the recommendation was read out in full during Committee of the Whole, um, I might recommend it to Council to, uh, with their leave, allow Councillor Elliott to simply move the motion on the floor. Oh, Do we have the leave of Council to have oh. Councillor Elliott move the motion on the floor? <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> I'm opposed. Uh, we have to have a seconder first, Councillor Danch. <laughs> To read it, the you? clerk went from black and white to a shade of gray for the first time ever. <laughs> I guess we have to have a motion Thank to adopt you. number 11 now with that. Yes, I'll move the, motion. move the motion. Move the yeah, motion. We're good. Mr. Elliott, seconder. Mr. Main. All those in favor? Carried. Okay, back to our meeting of the board of the management of the Port Coburn Historical Marine Museum at their meeting of January 20th. We move to accept those minutes. Motion. Councillor Butters. Seconder. Councillor Elliott. All those in favor? Carried. Any notices of motion this evening, Madam Clerk? Madam Council, are there any notices of motion from any of you this evening? There being none. At this stage, where there are a number of bylaws for uh, to be introduced and considered, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That the following bylaws be read three times and finally passed. Bylaw six one nine nine two five fifteen, being a bylaw to authorize entering into a transit in agreement extension with the. Corporation of the City of Welland for the local community bus and the link to Welland. Bylaw 6200-2615 being a bylaw to establish a schedule of rates and fees for the Valley Health and Wellness Center, Roselawn Center, Nickel Beach, Municipal Parks and Playing Fields, Sugarloaf Marina, and Special Event Services. Bylaw 6201-2715 being a bylaw to authorize entering into a contract agreement extension with Circle P Paving regarding tender 2013-9 citywide asphalt patch repair bylaw 62022815 being a bylaw to authorize entering into a contract agreement extension with provincial road markings previously known as provincial maintenance regarding tender 2012-12 citywide line painting bylaw 62032915 <coughs> Being a bylaw to authorize entering into a lease agreement renewal with Godrich Elevators Limited, and finally bylaw 62043015, being a bylaw to authorize entering into a contract agreement extension with Lawns and More regarding contract 2013 12 citywide bylaw grass mowing. Do we have a mover and a seconder for those bylaws? Be read three times. Moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Danch. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. <coughs> the following bylaw be read three times and finally passed. Bylaw 6205. 3115 being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Fort Colburn at its regular meeting of March 9, 2015. So a mover and a seconder. Mover, Councillor Doucette, seconded by Councillor Kenny. Any question discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. I'll consider a motion for adjournment. Councillor <laughs> Councillor Danch, seconded by Councillor Demaray. All those in favor? <coughs> Carry. Opposed? Carry. 
Thank you very much for your attendance this evening, members of staff. Appreciate that as well.